22 seasons for the Braves and the Mets. He won a World Series with the Braves in 1995. 10-time All-Star, two-time NL Cy Young Award winner, 305 career wins, fourth most in MLB history among left-handers. He was elected to the Hall of Fame in 2014. We are joined right now by Tom Glavin. Tom, it's been a minute, or actually more than that. It is good to have you back, Tom. How are you? It has been a minute. I'm good. How you doing? Good, Tom. Good. Great to have you on. So why don't I start with the obvious, get this out of the way since you'll be in the booth tonight and you'll be there. I know lots of fans are asking, hey, Tom, what about this Braves team? How does this edition of the Braves, who've got the best record in baseball, compare to the great Atlanta teams that you were a part of? Um, I don't know that it does, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, it's just a different makeup, um, you know. So many of those teams I played on, um, everything was re- revolved around pitching and defense. And, you know, it's not to say we didn't have good offensive clubs. We did. Um, but I don't know that we had any that any any lineups were, that were this good or this deep, right? I mean, you know, we certainly had a, a few of them that were really deep, probably one through six or one through five. But. You know, I don't know if any of them were as deep as this team is, one through nine. I mean, they virtually every guy in the lineup can take the ball out of the ballpark. They can hurt you. Um, and it's just a really tough team uh, for opposing pitchers to try to navigate because there's just nowhere to go to get out. We're talking to Tom Glavin. It's such a good point. And you mentioned your pitching. Tom, when you think back to those days, obviously you'll be with John Smoltz tonight. He was an incredible pitcher, a great, great competitor. And then, of course, you had Greg Maddox, who was an integral part of those great Brave staffs. And frankly, Tom, a source of great fascination to, well, me. <laughs> Maddox, man. Maddox really <laughs> was one of one. What is your favorite Greg Maddox story that you can share that is suitable for daytime radio and television? Um, well, there are a few, you know. And, I, and as time has gone on, Greg swears that a lot of these things didn't happen. But... <laughs> Um, you know, one of my favorite ones was, um, you know, we had, uh, back in those days, we didn't have all the analytics that there are today. So, um, you know, when you were pitching, if you were pitching the next day, you kept the pitching chart. So, you know, we kept score, uh, wrote down every pitch that was thrown and then the pitching coach would enter that information and, and do all that. So I remember there was a game that I went upstairs that Greg was charting. And about the third inning, and the, there was a lot of bickering on both sides with the home plate umpire. So I went upstairs and I asked Greg. I said, "Hey, how's this umpire?" I said, "You know, everybody's kind of complaining down there. He's, he, you know, he hasn't been bad. You know, he's kind of given a couple, taken a couple on both sides, but he hasn't been bad." So shortly after that, Bobby came up and asked him the same question. And he told Bobby that he said, "Bobby, this guy's terrible. He's missed so many pitches." He's missed a bunch on our side, more than he has on their side, and just went on and on. And, and Bobby walked out, and I was like, Greg, what are you doing? He said, what? I said, well, you know he's going to go downstairs and he's going to get thrown out of the game now because you told him the home plate umpire is terrible and he's squeezing our guy more than the other guy. And he said, oh, I know. So sure enough, next half inning, Bobby went downstairs and there was a close call and started arguing with the umpire and he got thrown out of the game. So that was that. That is funny. I, I tend to believe all these things that become so legendary and they seem like they're urban myths. I believe all of them, whether they're true or not. I just want to believe them about him. Like, Tom, I can't remember. Like, it, it's been so long. It was either you or John Smoltz. But I remember I did this interview with Maddox and one of the two of you when I worked for Fox back in the day. And I remember thinking, I can't believe Maddox is doing this. Maddox never does stuff like this. He never does these interviews. But I think that he was only doing it because either you or Smoltz, he was doing it but he made it really clear Tommy's like I have seven minutes and I mean seven not eight not nine but seven so I prep this thing so hard and I'm doing this interview and I'm going back and forth between the two of you and I ask him this really long thoughtful question and then it was either you or Smoltz who said hey Jim I'll handle that Greg left dude he left because the seven <laughs> minutes were up in the middle of a live interview on TV does that sound about right that sounds about right. I mean, I don't remember, it, so maybe it wasn't me. But, yeah, that kind of sounds about right. I mean, look, Greg, you know, Greg was, um, you know, he was a little quirky sometimes. But, you know, at the end of the day, super guy, uh, really intelligent about pitching. Um, but, yeah, I think he was, he was one of those guys that uh, he didn't love doing media stuff. 
Uh, he just kind of liked to be left alone and pitch and talk about pitching after he pitched. Uh, but leading up to it, he didn't really want to have much to do with it. So uh, that, that sounds like him. Yeah, don't get it twisted. I love the guy. I love everything about the guy. And I appreciate your, t- your story about him. Tom Glavin joining us. Hey, Tom, I wonder, remember when Steve Avery came up, man? God, he was a phenom. He was an absolute phenom. Also a source of fascination. Do you still check on him or talk to him and catch up with him? When's the last time you spoke to him? Yeah, he's one of the guys that I kind of do keep in touch with, um, you know, after our playing days. As a matter of fact, I just saw him last weekend. We had alumni weekend in Atlanta last weekend, and I don't know, I had about 50 guys come back, and he was one of them, so I got to catch up with him a little bit. And, um, yeah, I mean, Dave was a great dude. Um, you know, that that year he had in 1991 as a 21-year-old and that playoff he had uh, against Pittsburgh in the NLCS was just, Unbelievable. I think it was there that Andy Vance like uh, termed him Poison Avery. So um, that was that was fitting. I mean, he's you know it's unfortunate that uh, he had some injuries that derailed him a little bit, but um, he had a ton of talent. Certainly was a huge part of our rotation and and another guy that uh, was fun to be around and liked to play golf. So he fit in perfectly with our with our pitching rotation. And yeah, no doubt, man, he was filthy. He was so so dirty. Andy Van Slyke. It was a blast from the past. I don't want to age you and I both, but man, <laughs> that, that that was another great one, man. How awesome was Van Slyke, both on the field with a bat in his hand, and man, he could turn a phrase. He was a great guy to talk to. He good. He was a good player. I mean, he, I think he was a little bit underrated at times. You know, he was one of those guys that um, you know I think you had to watch. Uh, a little bit more to appreciate him, but uh, he could play, you know, he could play, he could play outfield, he could hit, he was a timely hitter and uh, kind of guy that you knew when he got in the batter's box, he was going to give you a battle. Hey, Tom, before I ask you about tonight's broadcast, let me ask you one more thing. We were talking about Bobby Cox. You know, baseball has always had that code or it's set of unwritten rules. And I've always been of the opinion, Tom, that unless you play the game at the highest level, there's no way you could ever know what those rules actually were. How much of the rules or the code changed since you played? I mean, it's changed a lot. You can see it, right? I mean, um, you know, that whole phrase, let the kids play, uh, that's kind of what baseball is now. You know, you see, uh, you know, bat flips. You see uh, very exaggerated home run trots. uh, You know, all those things in the game. You see guys, um, you know, back when I played, you basically wore your uniform and you wore one of your team colors was your was your cleats. So they were either, either you know, black or blue or, or something, your primary color. You know, nowadays you look out on the field and guys have, you know, neon orange or neon yellow cleats or whatever. So it's, you know, it's a lot more um, colorful, so to speak. And, and, you know, look, I'm not I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I mean. I think initially my concern was, you know, that it, it was going to be hard to to draw the line, so to speak. Um, you know, how how much was too much of a home run celebration? How much was too much of a of a strikeout celebration? But you know, it doesn't seem to have been a problem. Um, I think these guys have um, embraced it. They're okay with it, and it's and it's you know, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just different from when I played, but. Um, you know, these guys seem to like it, and the fans seem to like it. Tom Glavin joining us. All right, as I mentioned, you're going to be in a booth for the Bally Sports South Broadcast, and you're going to team up with Chipper and John Smoltz, Jeff Francourt. Now, y'all did this, Tom, about 11 weeks ago to rave reviews. What was it like for you to get part of the band back together mm-hmm. and chop it up for a live broadcast? You know, it was a lot of fun, but I'm not going to lie. It was a little bit stressful, right? I mean, because I think – for all of us, um, you know, when we get back together, you know, that's one of the great elements of, of being teammates with these guys for so long. And, you know, I only played with Frank Corr for a minute, but uh, I've been broadcasting with him for a number of years now. And, look, he, he's a great dude. He fits right in with all of us. And, um, you know, but it's, it's that I, I feel fortunate that with these guys, it's the kind of relationship that even if I haven't seen them for a while, it's like when we get back together, it's like we saw each other yesterday and we're back in the locker room and you're talking smack and you're telling stories and you're having a great time. And, you know, I think for me personally, my biggest concern was, you know, when you get around those guys and you start talking shop a little bit, you know, there's a real good chance a cuss word is going to slip out somewhere because that's generally the nature of, of the conversation. So that was my biggest thing is I didn't want to say something on air that I, that I was going to get in trouble for. But um, I think that, you know, I, I, I think for the most part, people really liked it. I mean, look, it's different, right? I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of play-by-play going on. Um, and I think that was by design. You know, when they asked us if we would be willing to do this, we, you know, and we all said yes. 
I think their vision was they wanted it to be conversational. They wanted it to be like we were in a bar with people watching the game with us, and you know that that's kind of what we tried to do. And I think it came across that way, and we had some fun. Um, you know, a lot of storytelling, a lot of ragging on each other and things like that. But I think, you know, all in all, I think people really enjoyed it. I'm not sure it's the kind of broadcast you'd want to watch every night. Um, but I think it was fun for people. And I think tonight it'll be fun and, you know, maybe a little bit more parameters and a little bit more guidelines. Uh, but I think it'll still be a lot of, um, smack talking and storytelling too. I think, I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. I think that's what, exactly what that is. It's different and people want to get that different vibe. I think to your point that you were a little stressed and a little concerned that you might drop a four letter bomb or something like that. That's understandable. I always say this because especially if you move from platform to platform like Tom, there are things that I can say on this show or there are things I could say on a podcast or another thing that I do that I would never say on this show. It just doesn't work. Or things that I would say on a podcast that I would never tweet. Or, like, you have to know your room. But I can see where you get together with the guys, and all of a sudden it feels like you're in the clubhouse, but you're not. You're, you're on air, and you don't want to get too comfortable. I would just ask this. Like, you all have takes. You all have strong personalities. You all have something to say. How do you divvy up all the airtime? You know, that's a good question. And, and I think that was a little bit of a concern, too. But I, but I think that's where, you know, that's a much harder dynamic if you're in a traditional broadcast, right? Because, you know, when you're in a traditional broadcast, you know, the, the rule of thumb is you're not, or at least trying not to talk over the action, right? So if you've got an opinion or you've got something to say, when you've got, when it's just you as a color analyst and your, and your play-by-play guy, that's fairly easy. When you start to have a two-man booth or a three-man booth with two analysts, that's a little tougher because you got to defer to one another, especially now with the pitch clock, to talk about what it is you want to say, and then the pitch comes and, and there's action and you don't want to be talking over it. I think in this format it worked because we weren't concerned about talking over the action. I think people knew that's what it was going to be. So if there was some bantering going on or there was some conversation based around something, we weren't worried about the parameters of the play that was going on on the field. We just talked. We finished our stories. You know, We would interject it, oh, by the way, fly ball left field for a second out of the inning, whatever. Um, so I think it's a little bit easier when you don't have uh, that parameter of not trying to talk over the action. Right. Um, but again, I think that's where, you know, it'd be, it'd be tough to do that in a traditional broadcast where, you know, like I said, especially with the pitch clock now, you better get your thoughts in and get them in quickly before the next pitch comes. I like it. He's a Hall of Famer. Tom Glavin, my guest. So that should be a lot of fun. Chipper Jones, John Smoltz, Jeff Rancor. That's the Bally Sports South broadcast between the Mets and the Braves tonight. Pre-game coverage getting underway at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Tom, great to get caught up. Have a great time with that, and it's really nice to have you back on. Thanks so much. It was great talking to you, Jim. Have a good day. You too. Tom Glavin. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell to be the first to know when we do upload a new video.